Hey everyone! So the second month of 2019 wasn't quite as busy as the first, but it was still pretty stressful at times. There were some really cool parts though. Uh, one thing was I got to act in Kevin Reese's feature film Sid's Lake. Uh, he threw me a bit part because I'd acted in three of his short films before that and he wanted to just kind of sprinkle in different actors that he'd worked with uh, even though none of the parts were quite the right age for me. So I drove out for the shoot and the actress that was supposed to be in the scene with me showed up a little late uh, which was kind of cool because it meant I got to talk to the cast and crew a little bit more and get to know them a little better uh, until it started to get a little bit close to rush hour from when I would be going back uh, but luckily she showed up and we got the scene shot and it was pretty quick. I've also been remastering films for the Los Angeles Film and Real Club. Uh, that's mostly just like small editing tweaks, uh, making sure that everyone's credited well in the rolling credits at the end, uh, some color grading, little audio work, that kind of stuff. Um, but we've gotten maybe like eight to ten different short films done, uh, so I'm kind of feeling accomplished and proud that that's actually done uh, after, you know, months of, you know, working and tweaking on different projects. The only problem is a lot of the time what I'm remastering is from an export from the original editor which if you've ever been an editor you know that that can be really difficult because you have to basically cut the film back into pieces if you want to change anything. Uh, audio is basically stuck as one track, there's not a whole lot you can do. Because I'm working with the export uh, I'm just giving myself like additional editing or remaster by credit because one, I don't want people to see this as, you know, my work because there is already an editor and two, there's already an editor who should get credit for that. It's kind of a little unusual in that regard, so it's difficult and I wouldn't want to be seen as the editor of this because, you know, it's not my best work because I'm not even working with the original footage. I'm just doing what I can. So I've been waiting to mention this one for a while but Steven Sanborn, a fellow Franklin alumni and a long-term writer, has been writing a feature film script for me to direct and star in. It's a psychological thriller, and he's been working on it for several months at this point. I won't say too much about it yet, because I don't want to give anything away, but he's a great screenwriter, and he really knows how to tell a story, which is what I look for more than anything else. I'm a little hesitant about both directing and starring in it, because that would be the third feature that I've done that with and I don't want to do that too much in my career, but at the same time, you know, it's a great opportunity. How could I pass that up? But in other news, Michael Buffo, the producer from the third feature film that I directed, the first one that I directed in the US, uh, he reached out to me and let me know that Henry Santos, the head of Chroma Hollywood, is interested in helping us with post-production. So this is War of the Limelight. I was hired to direct this one right after my senior year at Whittier College, and I jumped on board about a month before production started. This was a little problematic because, because of various different reasons. Pre-production was really rushed, there just wasn't enough time, so I ended up being given what was essentially a 36-page outline of the film itself. Some scenes were entirely written out, others were just a description. So I had a lot of creative control but not a whole lot of time to use it and to really craft what the story was going to be. There was an overall plot arc and several good character arcs within it, but I had to do a lot of improv scenes where I would give people, all right, here's where you start, this is what's supposed to happen, this is how it ends, let's see how this would play out between these two characters. They had to know their characters really well for that. But that worked to a certain extent. I was able to fill in plot holes and do things that way. And sometimes it would even get to the point where I would just text actors on my phone, like, here's your lines. And there you go. Start memorizing the lines I just texted to you. And while we're setting up lighting and camera and that kind of stuff, you can be rehearsing and I'll be, you know, guiding you through the process. Some of the actors even wrote the scenes themselves. So it really had an original organic feel in how it developed but it means it needs a lot of work in post-production to make that whole story make sense and to seem like one film instead of, you know, several different pieces. So to make sure that the post-production process goes smoothly, I wanted to have an actual full feature-length script. So what I did was I went through the film that we have cut together and I rewrote the script based on what we shot. So if there was an improv scene, 
I would write in the lines that they had improved in order to make that make sense so that you can follow the story by reading the script through the same way you could by watching the film. I also tweaked a couple little things in how I imagined it when I was on set but we weren't able to do in post-production so far. So hopefully that all comes together and helps make a great product. The script ended up being a little over 90 pages long compared to the 36 that we started with. So you can see how much of that was added in later. But I met with uh, Henry Santos at the old Technicolor building uh, where he has an office and he has an amazing color suite that I would love to color grade on. Um, he's got the whole setup and he seems like a really cool guy. I think it's going to be a really fun and interesting process seeing how far we can take this film. Uh, the first step for that is Michael Buffo is going to be sending me a hard drive and I'll be using that to back up all the footage and get everything in one place so that uh, Henry can reconstruct the editing timeline from that. I know this is getting a little technical but you get the idea. The reason he wanted to work on the film is because he thinks that it has a really relevant message and he wants to get that out to the world. I'm really glad to hear that because, to be honest, I feel really strongly about what this film is about. Uh, let me rewind a little and, and tell you a little bit about the story. So War of the Limelight is about a teenage Syrian refugee who gets brought over to the U.S. illegally and hidden in order to save her life. She meets the son of a Mexican immigrant who falls in love with her, and he tries to help give her the life that he was given freely, based on the fact that he was born in the U.S. It takes a hard look at socioeconomic disparity, immigration policy, and really how we treat human beings. I'm passionate about this film myself for a lot of reasons. Uh, my grandmother was an immigrant from Mexico, not quite legally. Uh, my godfather was born and raised in Turkey. I grew up in Istanbul. And that's where a lot of the refugees are staying. A lot of the refugee camps are either on the Turkish border or the uh, border of Greece and the Mediterranean. Some of the investors are family friends of my dad and I that are either from the Middle East or really want to see this publicized, want people to know what's actually going on. And I will say it only scratches the surface of, you know, one life of one individual in the U.S. So, you know, it's not going to be showing you what the war is like there or what's going on exactly, but it hints at much bigger issues that I hope will get people thinking about this and trying to find ways to help. Maybe the number one reason why I want to see this film get out there is because I was actually in Istanbul when Joe Biden came to say that they were giving help to Syrian refugees and I got to see the protests of that. I watched the protesters marching down the streets calling for him to go home. People did not want to help the refugees and that's something that I've seen not just in Turkey also in Greece, also in the U.S., it's been really difficult to get people to want to help these people. And the executive producer of the film was actually at the refugee camps in Greece helping out and saw just how bad it was, how many people were dying there. And she said it seems similar to internment camps and concentration camps and the amount of people dying. But I saw the tears on the faces of the people at the premiere. And I really feel like this could impassion people and get people not only aware of the issues that are going on more than they already are, but feeling like they can help and that they will try to do something to help. Because it is possible. Canada is helping all sorts of refugees that the U.S. won't take. So I'm hoping that this film gets out there with Henry's help and others and that it really can start to change things. So the first step in that process is getting the external hard drive, which I'll be receiving soon, and then we'll continue from there. I know they got really serious for a minute, but on a lighter note, uh, Kellen Gibbs, a filmmaker friend of mine that I've been working with since high school, just released his newest film, In the Mind's Eye, which I got to go to the screening of for the cast and crew, family, friends sort of thing, and is also going to be in a film festival later on, um, and I really like what he did with this film. Uh, I like I like everything he makes. He's one of my favorite directors to work with, and I was the key grip on this set. And it's kind of a funny story. I've only ever key gripped for him. I've never key gripped on any other sets that aren't his, and I've key gripped on, I believe, the set of 
every film that he's made in L.A. Uh, originally, he needed a key grip, so I filled in the position, and he kept hiring me back for it. So I'm always happy to do that, and if anyone else ever wants me to key grip, I can key grip. And that's pretty much February. I'll see you next month, which will be even better.